talking about uh, the reform. I, I, I am sure that all those sitting here um, are very well aware of the concept and um, are very well aware of the various aspects of reform. But before coming to the public sector reform, let me just say that it is at times good to go through the basics again. So what is reform? And instead of going through a very flowery and perhaps a difficult uh, definition of reform, I would restrict myself to the basic because that is what is important at the end of the day. So reform essentially means an attempt to change something, either an institution or a practice, in order to improve it. So it's, it's very, very simple, really. Um, but when you see uh, that if it is so simple, then why people around the world, particularly us, keep on failing to do it? What is it that makes it so difficult? And let me very honestly say at the very start, and I'll come back to that later, uh, that the basic thing which makes us fail this time and again is our capacity to do it. And for doing it, we need to learn something. And the problem with us, particularly the public sector, and I'll just define the public sector reform also, um, the problem with the public sector is that each one of us, and I'm including myself in it, each one of us has a notion and an idea of reform or a thesis of reform which starts with reforming everybody else except himself. Now that is from where the whole problem starts. So if you ask the bureaucracy about the bureaucratic reforms, uh, they will never talk about their own reform. They will talk about the reform of business and they will say the business in Pakistan is full of wrong practices. They will say the judicial process is an impediment. They will say, you know, every other institution they will talk about except themselves. You talk about judicial reform, they say that we are out of your scope. You can't even touch it because it, hin it impedes the independence of judiciary uh, and the constitution says that you can't touch it. Uh, you talk about any other area, so let me not waste more time. So basically the issue is that we want to reform everybody else other than ourselves. Now, what is public sector reform? And again, the very simple uh, definition is that a deliberate change to the processes and the systems and structures of the public sector organizations with the objective to getting them perform better. Now that's a very, very wide definition. It leaves everything open, right? Um, and it leaves a lot open to actually the imagination of the person who is doing it. And I, I really admire the person who wrote this very, very simple definition. I admire him because as the time moves on, the need for reform also takes new shapes. So if you would come up with a very firewalled kind of a definition of public sector reform, so what was probably required for public sector reform in the 60s and 70s will be totally irrelevant today. Or if we really keep the pace of the world as it is moving in the 21st century, what was required three years back will be totally irrelevant today because the world is moving on too quickly for all of us. Now public sector reform, obviously it means that you require and you sit down to do the public sector reform at a point in time when you feel that it is not performing better or it is not performing well enough to deliver for which it has been essentially constituted. Now the question is, this is a conclusion to which we have come for the last, I think ever since I have achieved my conscious age that the public sector is not performing well enough. But over the same period, instead of public sector being reformed or reduced in size, I've seen the size 
and the footprint of the public sector increase not by percentage points, but by times. So when I joined the service, I think the public sector was at least three times less in its size than it is today. And all through this period, we have been consistently hearing, and I'm sure Dr. Saab has been hearing it even longer, we have been consistently hearing that it has been decided that it is time to reform the public sector. Now let me just give you a couple of numbers and probably that will make um, my point more clear. Today, only the federal government has 207 state-owned enterprises as of today, 207. And out of them, 87 are commercial enterprises. And for these enterprises, in the years between 2018 and 21, three years, the state of Pakistan, in whatever economic conditions, I do not want to deliberate on it because each one sitting here is fully aware of that. In those three years, the state of Pakistan in shape of grants, subsidies, loans, and a small amount of equity investment, which was the sh smallest of all, provided 2.542 trillion rupees to these enterprises. 2,542 billion rupees in just the four years, 2018 to 21, for um, actually, if you cut it down, it was three financial years. So that is the amount of money which the state of Pakistan, which is borrowing everything, and it was borrowing even in 2018 and 19 to run its essential expenditures, just injected into these SOEs. So we can see that what is the state of the problem. Now it's very easy for us uh, to go forward and then say that which ones are the SOEs which are getting the lion's share out of it. But let me come to that later and first address that what should not be considered to be included in reform. That is, I think we need to do this examination because every time that the public sector or any of its organizations or any of its ministries or any of its divisions decides to reform itself, these are, and I've just listed four or five of the things, that is what they end up doing. And in my view, my humble view, those are all the areas that are by no stretch of imagination included in the process of reform. The first one out of that is that anything which increases the size of public sector's footprint cannot be considered reform, anything. Um, we can, if there are any counter views, we can address this, that in the question answer session because the time given to me is slightly uh, constrained. So I will go through the uh, views that I have and then we can, if there are any counter views, we can discuss that. So my first and foremost point is that anything which increases the public sector's footprint cannot be called public sector reform. Number two, anything which essentially aims to increase the power of state functionaries at the expense of the common people, whether it is the power of somebody sitting in the Ministry of Industries to give a permission or a license, or it is the power of a taxman who has failed to perform for the last three decades, four decades, and who now claims that he needs more powers in order to perform the job that he has consistently failed to do for the last many decades. So anything which increases the power of the state functionaries um, cannot be, you know, unless and until it can be justified 
in exactly very, very clear and arithmetically representative solutions, that that is why, what will it bring as an outcome? Uh, merely an assumption that if you give me this power, it will result in this, it is not going to work. And it should not be considered a public sector reform. The third thing, that anything which either provides or tries to stretch the exclusive domain of state to do certain businesses, it cannot be considered reform. And that would exclude only two things. One, the absolute authority and exclusive authority to the use of gun. And the second, the exclusive authority to tax. Other than that, there can't be in a system, in a government which is functioning in a capitalist system, the word that we see today, there can't be exclusive domains for the state or its institutions. Everything else has to be open. And any reform or any effort or any measure that tries to restrict this domain to either one institution of the state or a couple of institutions of the state or excludes, tries to exclude all others from doing that, it cannot be and it should not be considered as a reform. Number four, any increase in the size of bureaucracy cannot be considered a reform. You know, I, I'm saying that out of my experience. I think I can't even count the number of times when we talk to, say, the people working our colleagues, I'm not pointing to anybody else, say, in the uh, Ministry of Food Security, that let us work, the system has changed, agriculture is now a subject of the provincial governments, we are only here to do certain policy and other measures, so, and research, of course. So let us talk about reform. Invariably, whatever proposals came back to us, was that we need to have two more section officers, four more deputy secretaries, six more joint secretaries, and maybe an additional secretary, because this is what used to happen when it was Ministry of Food and Agriculture and Livestock. So, but when you say that it is no more the great minfall, it is just supposed to do the job of um, policy and research, so where are the, uh, inclusions or improvements in the research institutions that are working. Believe me, I have never come across a proposal from anyone which said that, okay, we want to reform the Pakistan Agriculture Research Council and bring in, say, the scientists or bring in research analysts or bring in, you know, the expertise that you need there. And second, I'll only give two examples. Otherwise, you know, we can talk about every single, um, you know, uh, sector of the government. Second is the tax. And I think tax sector reform should be seen as a case study whenever we want to discuss um, what is public sector reform and what is impeding the growth and prosperity which is where we want to go ultimately. Again, I do not recall that there was even a single time when uh, the reform of tax sector, any proposals came which said that we have seen the use of these powers, these have been used arbitrarily, these has been used selectively, this has not yielded the right results, so we want to do away with these powers, and we want to bring up this reform which will make, which will still have the powers with the tax man, but he will be more transparent, he will be more inclusive, and he will be more accountable. Now let me just give you one example. I normally do not do that, but uh, I think for making it, <clears throat> in 2016, after three years of then government, 2013, 14, 14, 15, and 15, 16, uh, we requested the Prime Minister that the Prime Minister office has looked at the work of the Federal Board of Revenue and wants to make a presentation in the presence of the finance minister and the then chairman and 
FPR and the Finance and Revenue Secretary. Uh, and the purpose is that we want to identify, we think there are certain areas which need uh, the attention of the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister. So we were granted that opportunity and for that presentation, we only used the data which was provided by the FPR. We did not try to get any data on our own. We did not go to you know, the businessman, we did not go to the industrialists, we did not go to the traders, we did not go to any, or even the, um, you know, the DFIs working in Pakistan. We just took their data, and a few young people working in the Prime Minister's office at that time who were very good at uh, analysis, and a few, I'll just point out two, three things. And this is at a time when the entire tax target for the year was 1,980 billion rupees. Um, you know, it was fixed to reach that revenue at the end of the year. So the first outcome of the analysis of the data that the FPR gave us, and both the chairman and the then secretary agreed that this is their data that has been analyzed. The first takeout was that 93% of Pakistan's tax collection is either voluntary or withholding. And the entire Federal Board of Revenue actually collects just 7% of the revenue, which even if you want to be generous with numbers, was about 200 billion. So the entire, whatever you have laid down across Pakistan in districts, divisions, circles, you name it, uh, the chief collectors, the special units, the special taxation units, the large taxpayers units, whatever. I would be very happy if the things have changed now, but I don't expect that they have changed. Because the mind which works for the taxation reform has not changed. Uh, for us, the tax reform in Pakistan is only achieving a certain number. And I think nobody will be probably able to adjudicate better on that than Dr. Uh, Manzoor Saab. Um, and of course, I see a number of other faces in this audience also. So the first outcome or take out was that only 7% is collected by the Federal Board of Revenue. And for that, the amount of powers that are given to the tax collector in Pakistan are not available to anybody else anywhere. You know, uh, it sits, you know, we are always, um, it is always said that in Pakistan, the taxpayer cannot touch the big guns, they can't touch the big business. That may be correct. That does not mean that they do not have the statutory powers to do that. That means that they do not have either the moral courage to do it themselves or they do not have an enabling working atmosphere to do that, which will bring in a large number of other factors. So this was, uh, you know, the, the, the first takeout. The second was, and this was very, very important, and we were not reviewing any other government. We were just reviewing the three years of our own government at that point in time because it is always easier to say that the last government has done this thing wrong and we are doing absolutely fine. So in 2013, 14, 14, 15, and 15, 16, the three financial years that preceded that, the audit section of FBR issued recovery notices between a range of 150 billion to 275 billion. And I can precisely cite 150 billion in 1314, 175 billion in 1415, and 275 billion in 1516. And the recoveries against those notices of these amounts in the first year was 750 million. In the second year, it was 2.5 billion, and in the third year, it again came down to about 1.6 billion. 
This is a part of the record. Anybody can go and check it. Because this was their, their data, you know, we, have not, we had not taken it out from anywhere. So can you imagine that, say, put up together notices of about 600 billion issued to various taxpayers in Pakistan or non-taxpayers in Pakistan resulted in a collection of less than 4 billion rupees. The third thing, and that is one game that um, every government plays and continues to play, the increase in the number of taxpayers. You know, I, I'm sure all of us know that every year one of the key features of the finance minister's speech, budget speech, is that the number of tax filers has increased from 400,000 last year to 700,000 this year and then 7 to 1.4 million, and then 1.4 to 1.8 million. But nobody tells you that how many out of those filers actually pay the tax. So how many of them give a nil return, and how many out of them um, uh, actually pay some kind of tax? Let us forget that what is the tax that they give. So. Let us stop here and let us see that what has happened on the tax reform side from 2016 to 2023. So this is what was the numbers and analysis and look at what, you know, we did with reform after that. In the seven years, we allowed once the tax collector to have access to bank accounts of individuals. We increased their powers to freeze accounts, to freeze business accounts without, with or without any justification, even based on presumptions. We increased their powers to summoning individuals, forcing their attendance, even if they were taxpayers for the last two or three decades. And we did everything. And every time, the only suggestion that came to the government or to the parliament was that we can't collect the tax because we do not have enough parts. Now, my humble submission is that any reform of the system which starts with this premises is bound to fail. Because first, an account has to be taken of what has been done with the powers that were already available to you. And we never start with that. We never do the analysis bit. We just do what we need. And you know, again, it just works the wrong way through. We set down a number in our mind that we have to achieve, and that number is also now forced upon us. It is not we who decide that number. Somebody else decides it for us that this year the collection has to go 9,200 billion, and then we work it the way through. And in the same period, let me point out one final thing and then we can move forward. In the same period of time, the tax burden on a genuine taxpayer, particularly the corporate taxpayer in Pakistan, the three years, was increased by 40% on average. So those who were paying taxes, particularly those who were corporatized, and this is again data analysis, not an assumption. Those who were corporatized were actually being disincentivized and asked to decorporatize. And I think if we have done one thing effectively well, we have actually decorporatized Pakistan. We have encouraged everybody to stay out of the tax net. And, um, you know, the former Prime Minister, Mr. Abbasi, used to say that nowhere else in the world you will hear the term non-filer. Only in Pakistan you can hear this. So this, you know, by increasing to tax the corporate word or people who are documented, you are actually bringing in or encouraging people to be non-filers. And one final thing that... In that year, 
2016, it was a great agriculture year for Pakistan. And it was widely accepted that in that year alone, the agriculture sector in Pakistan had an additional income of 650 billion rupees. Additional income, over and above their normal income. They had a bumper wheat crop, they had a good crop other than the cotton, all other crops went very well. So they increased their income by 650 billion rupees. And the day that we made the presentation, the total collection of agriculture income tax in the entire Pakistan, all the four provinces, provincial governments, was something like seven and a half billion rupees. That was the total income, uh, total tax, sorry, collected. So um, <coughs> I just listed out that, you know, these are the things in my view who, which cannot be considered reform. And I will just say two more things, that public sector reform should essentially have a policy to develop the private sector, because this is the way the word has gone. And if you see all the policies of reform in Pakistan, you will not even see probably the word private sector anywhere. You know, even if when we are forced to talk about reform, we never talk about, okay, if the state will go out of this, who will take this place? Who will come? So we never end, and the word over, Anywhere from where the government goes out, it also provides an enabling way for the private sector to come and perform those functions. And second, the reform has to include a capacity in the government to regulate the sectors from where it is going out, because that is extremely important. If we don't do that, at the same time, I think we are going to, um, always result, we are going to always face a situation in which there will be cartelization. And we have seen that happening too many times. So that is the reason that whatever, you know, prosperity has come to Pakistan, it has not reached the common man, or it has not reached, let us not, you know, go for cliches of common man, let us say that it has not reached the majority of the people, because Whatever money is made, whenever, you know, more prosperity comes to a certain sector, like say banking sector, the government went out, the private sector came in, the losses started to disappear, the profits, you know, the write-off started to disappear, uh, the financial inclusion, inclusion started to improve, and the profits of the bank slowly and steadily started to improve. To an extent that they found it an atmosphere where they can actually go for a kill. And they did that in the last three years. Because in spite of the fact that so much about the touted reforms in the State Bank of Pakistan, the State Bank did not intervene. It was their job to intervene, they did not. I'm glad that the caretaker government has now, you know, taken this step. And it was a very important step. Even if it is a beginning, I think it is a very good indicator that this is one of the primary functions of a government to ensure that whenever there is business without the government, the government has to act as a regulator and has to perform that role very, very effectively. Now, my just coming to the conclusion, <coughs> my view is that there are two reforms which are essential for Pakistan to go to the path of prosperity. Prosperity. I'm not saying that we can, you know, reach that overnight, or we can achieve. We are we are too way, too much. Um, you know, we are, we are backed by a few centuries now in comparison to the world. And even in our, you know, in comparison to the countries in our region or in our income groups, I think, in terms of the way we work, in terms of the public sector in terms of private sector ethics and principles, I think we are far, far behind. So I think, in my way, there are two things which are essential. One is bureaucratic reform, and that would mean, I will just briefly say, number one, reducing the size 
of both the federal governments and the provincial governments and increasing the size of the local government. And when I say that, it is based on, again, a study that we did. For a normal ministry, for a federal secretary in the government of Pakistan, if a paper is received on his desk, for that paper to come back to his table, it needs about 27 days. And this is based on a study. It is, again, not an assumption. From secretary to additional secretary to joint secretary to deputy secretary to section officer, then to the assistant, and then, you know, the, uh, the return journey. And if somebody has gone for a meeting in Karachi, the file stays at his table for two days. If somebody has gone on visit abroad, it can stay on the table for three, four days, unless and until, you know, somebody is pushing that and calling for it. So I think the first and the foremost is bureaucratic reform, and that would require reducing the number of tiers in both the federal government and the provincial government. And I've been advocating that for at least now 15 years. The first time I said this was 2008, when I was Secretary of Services in the government of Punjab, that we should have at the maximum three tiers in the federal government and two tiers in the provincial government. And it is based on the fact that if you see the files going through from one level to the top level, there is no value addition. There is hardly a value addition. I can count on my fingers the number of people in the federal bureaucracy today who can make or add value to the examination of a file or framing of a policy. So normally it just stays at the table and, you know, with some small little Observations, it is then marked up and then same way marked down. And nine out of ten times, when it reaches the secretary, instead of going through the entire note sheet, he says, please discuss and send it back again. So the first and the foremost thing that we need in bureaucratic reform is reduce these tiers. And second thing, I am constrained to say this, because, you know, every time that we have talked about reform, um, we have ended up talking about the buy-in. My humble request is, and I do not know whether the others on the panel or in the hall will agree to that, we are not a society which will, in which any institution, more so the bureaucracy, will ever agree or will ever, um, you know, um, come on board for reducing either their powers or their size. So buy-in is not possible. Reform is always very well considered. You spend a lot of time on it. You think about it very dispassionately. But at the same time, you have to be merciless when you actually go and implement it. When you finalize it and when you implement it, you can't really ask for people that, please, OK, I will instead of 40 seats for you, I'll have 50 seats in 21, and please accept what I'm saying. It doesn't happen really that way. And I will quote that the famous uh, administrative reforms of 1973 that Mr. Bhutto did. There's one sentence um, that our seniors used to tell us. Uh, his establishment secretary was Mr. Vakar Ahmed, who was an officer of Pakistan Audit and Account Service. And he was his establishment secretary. So Bhutto Saab said one evening that God willing and Vakar Ahmed living, there will be no civil service of Pakistan. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be kind of merciless. I'm saying this because three years, I respect Dr. Ishrat Saab a lot. He has been a you know, wonderful person and wonderful senior. But three years, he was trying to have the buy-in from various service groups of the civil service for the bureaucratic reform. And we have gone even worse in that. So, you know, this is one thing. First and the foremost requirement is a bureaucratic reform. I will not go into detail. But one can have a blueprint on that. I have a blueprint on that. I keep on talking about it within the government circles. But it will only happen when somebody decides that, okay, I'm going to do it. Otherwise, you know, we will continue to struggle. And second thing is uh, the tax reform. Um, and um, no matter what kind of 
foreign direct investments we get in, no matter what kind of bilateral support we get in, no matter what kind of strategic partners we have, the lesson of the last three decades is that nothing will work unless and until we do not collect the taxes that we must. And again, a simple thing is that we keep on talking about increasing the tax to GDP ratio from 8% to 15% or even to 18%. And this is like very, very good things to think about and stay happy that one day we are going to reach this. I keep on requesting everyone that let us not talk about increasing it from 8 to 15 or 18 percent of the GDP. Let us just try to recover 8 percent of the actual GDP of Pakistan, not the documented GDP. And you know, there is virtually a consensus that as, as against the somewhere around $300 billion of you know, the reported GDP, the actual size of GDP is about 1.2 trillion. So just, you know, my, I always keep on requesting that we can do the increase bit later on. Let us just ensure that everybody who should pay tax is paying taxes. And that would, at least for the moment, solve our problems, or at least most of them. And then we can look at taking it from eight to nine and nine to 10 and 10 to 15% one day. So I'll finish here. I, I think these are the two basic things with which we need to start if we really want um, that Pakistan should progress. And I think that more than anything else, it is the caretaker's domain to at least prepare the footprint for that, or the blueprint for that. Uh, maybe, um, and of course, I'm very clear that we do not have the authority to legislate on these issues. And there may not be new legislation which is required, actually. The legislation is already there. Pakistan, one of my friends who practices law was saying, is the most over-legislated country in the world. He says there is a legislation for everything that has not, not happened in this country. And there is no legislation for everything that happens every day in this country. So, uh, you know, we may not even need to legislate, we just need to do what we are required to do, and that is do these two reforms, and the uh, road to progress and prosperity, I'm sure, can start from there. It may not be an easy road to travel. Nobody has done that easily. It's a very painful, all kinds of reform are very painful, and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, it is only later when you achieve the progress and prosperity that you start to feel happy. The process of going to that place is quite difficult. But I'm sure with the collective will of everybody all around, it is very much doable. Thank you very much.